What do I torture? I know. I, I said the same thing before I started the stream. I, I swear to God, I said like something very similar. I'm like, why am I doing this? First time I played King's Quest VI, I must have been seven or eight years old. Everything about the game was so good. The sounds, the, the voices, the music, the story, the characters. Just fell in love with that immediately. I, I'll never forget the garden full of puns is my favorite place. I swear to God, in like any video game. The first time I remember playing it takes a little bit to get installed. Then the opening music plays and I'm just like, you have my full attention. And I was like, I'm going to remember this game forever. But when you have to play a flute for some flowers to get a hole in a wall to make sure that you can complete the catacombs, those details just, they don't leave you. Someone gave me the advice that you should speed run your favorite game, right? Because then you know you'll be committed to it and you'll work really hard on it. So I was like, well, my favorite game is King's Quest VI. I wonder if anyone has ever done it before. <laughs> Point-and-click adventure games aren't the most obvious choice for a speedrun. After all, once you know the story and the solutions to the puzzles, what more is there to do? I'm one short eye, and today I want to help answer that question by sharing with you one of my favorite games and the quest to finish it as quickly as possible. Released in 1992, King's Quest VI puts you in the shoes of Prince Alexander of Daventry, who sails to the land of the Green Isles in pursuit of Princess Cosima, a love interest he met for 30 seconds at the end of the previous game. When he arrives, he finds Cosima's parents have died and the very obviously evil advisor, Abdul Alhazred, has locked up the princess with plans to marry her. Undaunted, Alex sets out to rescue Cosima and defeat Alhazred, unraveling the Isles' mysteries along the way. In October of 2007, runner The Cybercat posted a run of King's Quest VI to the Adventure Speedruns website. They complete it in a little over an hour, getting all 231 points, which you receive by talking to characters, solving puzzles, and picking up everything that isn't nailed down. Three years later, a runner named Seppel would make this post explaining their route. About half of the puzzles in the game are completely optional because there are two branching paths. The Cybercat took the longer path, gathering materials for magic spells, venturing through the underworld, and challenging Death himself to release the souls of Princess Cosima's parents, who assist you in the endgame. Seppel takes the short path, disguising Alex as a peasant serving girl and infiltrating the castle that way. This means not having to get as many items and skipping the underworld sequence altogether. The embedded videos in the post are no longer available, and Seppel doesn't list a time for their speedrun, but the next runner, Sambrea, completed the game in a little over 36 minutes by using the short path. Sambrea never submitted their run to any leaderboards, so a year later, when Bill Bull tried his hand at the game, he was unaware of it and started from scratch rereading old forum posts apparently i didn't know how to beat the game using the short route before i did the speed run never really explored that so i remember getting into the castle and then getting stuck because i didn't have the mockingbird you can't leave so i have to reload an old save a little bit later oh i didn't grab the peppermint from the cave so i can't kill the genie at the very end of the game <laughs> For me, the challenge was just trying to figure out what exactly triggers these events to occur. You know, what can I cut out? What can I skip? Bill would earn a 25-55 in the any percent category and put the game down after that. For me, it was more about just figuring out the route. That's always been the thing that's interested me about speedrunning games. I really don't care about execution that much. Once I have what I think at the time is a good route, I very quickly move away from that game. So there's still tons of stuff that I still miss because you know, one person will never find everything by themselves. We, everything we do is built on other people's work, and at the time there just wasn't any other work. 
In December of 2014, Ethan Wolfcat would get a world record in the 100% category, earning all points in a little over 51 minutes. This time would be beaten by Korzik three months later. So far, all the runs have essentially been efficient let's plays, the kind of thing you would see if you played the game with a walkthrough and skipped all the dialogue. It doesn't seem like a very interesting speed game, but that would soon change. <sighs> okay, so let's try again. I was doing logic grid puzzles when I was like six or seven, and I just love them. So back when I was, you know, really young and playing this game, it was really kind of like the first outlet I had that was like a story plus this type of problem solving puzzle. And that just kind of gave it this very full life character story to these puzzles. And that connection is just something that I think King's Quest VI does better, honestly, than any game I have ever played. Aha! It honestly felt a lot like I was exploring the Wild West. The little bit of like glitch hunting that I did was trying to, to just test out all the different versions. And I happened to notice that when I tried the GOG version, it's so weird. He walks so much faster across the screen randomly. Jackie had unlocked the most powerful movement tech in the game, what she called glitchy fast walks, but have since come to be known as zips. So why does this happen? For that, let's talk to an expert. I'm Sluicebox, and I'm a member of the Scum VM project. And I work mostly on the SCI engine. And that's the part of Scum VM that runs Sierra games like King's Quest VI. Alex's speed is determined by the speed slider. Speeds 1 through 16, those are tethered to time. Um, so each one of those represents a delay in ticks or sixtieths of a second uh, that would occur between uh, each movement advancement. And so if you lower the slider, that number gets bigger, you've got bigger delays. So you go slower. But then the top one is special. That's speed zero. And when you want to go faster than a sixtieth of a second, what you have to do is just abandon time altogether. But then as time goes on and computers get faster, it's going to be the year 2000 and suddenly speed zero is really, really fast uh, because now it's about how many game cycles can we throw at your computer. So why doesn't Alex move at top speed all the time? When Alex completes a turn and faces a non-diagonal direction, there's code that suppresses his speed by two levels. And our assumption is that they noticed that it just looked a little more natural if they did that because they went to a lot of work to implement this. What you get is that on a fast computer that can do a lot of game cycles really quickly, turning and then facing a diagonal direction will put you in speed zero and now you can go really fast. So why didn't we see this in Bill's run? Bill and others before him were running the game using Scum VM, a program that can run old adventure games. ScumVM throttles the speed of King's Quest VI to make it more stable. Jackie had bought the game from GOG, which, at the time, distributed the game with DOSBox, a popular DOS emulator. DOSBox allows you to adjust the cycles, which are, roughly, how fast the emulator is running. At higher cycles, the zip effect is more pronounced. These increased cycles make Alex move fast, but they do have a few downsides. First, Alex needs to scale the Cliffs of the Sacred Mountain. We call them the Cliffs of Copy Protection because each screen has a puzzle solvable only by consulting the game's manual. The player needs to click on each stone, and a single misclick means... So, you want your clicks to be precise. You also want them to be fast because if you stand still, there's a random chance for Alex to lose his balance. Whoa, wait a minute. These whoa, wait a minutes are really annoying because they break your rhythm and take a moment to recover from. Whoa, wait a minute. Ah. On higher emulation cycles, they happen more and more frequently. The second downside to higher cycles? A group of Crashing, like that. Just as I say it, frick. Like I did a ton of research in how to fix this crash 
At one point, I even reached out to GOG directly to their customer service team. (laughs) Couldn't find anything with that. But I honestly thought that the crash was you know, somehow linked to the fast walk. So eventually I kind of gave up on trying to to figure out how to get rid of the crash because I kind of figured it would get rid of the, the fast walks as well. Despite having to restart the emulator and sit through the opening loading sequence, she still manages to beat out Bill Bull's time with a 25-24. Oh! Oh my God! Holy Three days later, she would push the record down even further. This time, she's routed in a better place to save and restart the game herself, instead of waiting for the game to crash. At the castle, Jackie demonstrates another challenging part of the run. One thing that happened a lot when I first started running the game was getting caught by the guard dogs. Hey, who the... Um, hello there. So I went and tested it, and I found that about 20% of the time I would get caught by the guard dogs. So in my head, I was like, okay. This is a 20% bad RNG. I think initially what I did was I would just wait a cycle. So I would wait for the guard dogs to first walk down, then turn around, then I would place the nightingale because that was like always 100% successful. But after a while I was like, ah, screw it, let's just YOLO it. Yeah, that was awesome. Jackie would also find something intriguing on the Isle of the Beast. When you pick up that brick that's on the screen, because of a problem or an oversight in the game's scripting language, they don't lock your cursor movement. You still have control of your cursor. Typically, when you pick up an item, you can no longer walk anywhere, grab anything, or do anything. You just have to wait. Jackie aptly called this the moonwalk glitch. And I'm feeling so excited because... It, it finally opened up to, oh my gosh, maybe there are glitches in this game. Corsic had actually discovered this a year earlier, but this knowledge was buried in a Speed Demos archive post and found in his 100% run, which Jackie hadn't seen because she wasn't running that category. Jackie also mentions the possibility of submitting to Awesome Games Done Quick. I don't know, I don't know if I'll submit to AGDQ period. I don't know. I don't know if this is interesting enough. I mean, GDQ is just like the Everest, right? It is like the one thing that anyone that casually understands speedruns knows about. When you run a game at GDQ, there's just, you know, this huge potential that that people will see it, you know, that people will see it, that people will get it, and that people will appreciate all of the time and energy that you've spent in it. So it was always kind of like the zenith of like, if I could get King's Quest VI into GDQ, then that's just like the goal, right? Jackie would end up not submitting the game, thinking the run too simplistic and not interesting enough for the big stage. She would take a break from King's Quest VI speedrunning for the next year or so. So I was in uh, getting in the middle of a divorce and I was moving uh, to a brand new city. I moved to New York City with nothing, basically. I sold my car to pay for my first year's worth of rent here and I didn't have a job lined up. So it was like a pretty risky thing to do. But at the same time, I was also started running The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. She would return to the game in January of 2017 becoming more adept at the game's controls and having overall better execution. Later that year, she would attend AGDQ, but as a spectator and not a runner. It was right before AGDQ, that would have been, I think, 2017. We had a friend um, from Germany come and stay with us named Seilier. I think it all started with like me meeting Jackie and that was, we just like came across on the Madras Mask community. And I convinced him while he was staying with us that he should learn King's Quest VI. I watched a couple of runs and I thought, yeah, that is a weird game. Um, I should play it at some point. Eventually, when I came back to Germany, I was like, yeah, okay, that King's Quest route looks cool. And it looks like you could like probably save like a minute or two on that. He was able to beat my time very quickly and found a lot of new strats that I was completely unaware of. So that was awesome. <laughs> I mean, it was all kind of precise and it's it's a fast paced game you know you don't have like cutscenes or anything so constantly like planning ahead and um, uh, that you have to be like constantly aware of everything the maze was like super slow back in the days so um, that was like my major point of improvement where i looked at 
And somewhat later, we found this like that you can hold enter, right? To press like uh, constantly left click. So like that shaved off like 20 seconds of clips of logic, I think, or a ridiculous amount of time. And it made it like super easy because you can't really fall anymore. By holding enter and placing the cursor just right, runners were now able to get the inputs off on the first frame possible. Still, there are ways to die on almost every screen, and knowing when to hold enter and when to let go becomes a delicate and deadly balancing act. For example, at this tile puzzle in the catacombs, Alex has to step on the correct tiles in the correct order to pass through unscathed. Step on the wrong tiles? Alexander feels the tile he's standing on shift beneath his feet. Uh Uh-oh! At some point, I just sat in, in a dark room and I tried this like maze for like three hours. And eventually I found out that like holding enter actually works if you just uh, practice it enough. Oh, that was one of the faster puzzles. Though still hindered by the crash and the guard dogs, Silier would eventually grind his time in any percent down to 20 minutes and 22 seconds and set 37 minutes and 40 seconds as the 100% world record. I think that's something I'm kind of good at, like trying to grind down some like technique to like make them faster, basically, or like to save time. I, I'm I've never been like that much into like, finding new routes or like rerouting stuff. Sylier would enter a sort of retirement at that point, and the summer of 2018 would find new runners entering the speedrunning scene. When Chuck Grody came along, also. I remember hanging out in his Twitch stream. He was doing all of the King's Quest games, which blew my mind. I was like, holy cow, that's insane. <laughs> and Lumophile as well. He came around about the same time, if I remember correctly, also doing all of the King's Quest games, which was incredible to me. The first game I started speedrunning actually was Donkey Kong Country 3. So I, I ran that for a while, then I ran DKC1 for a while. And then one day I decided, you know, huh, 12 hour challenge is coming up. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I'll give it a shot, you know, see see what I can do, and that's how I ended up doing the, um, the whole 7 Series run. One of the my favorite adventure game of all time, um, ironically, it's not King's Quest, but is uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. It's a game I remember playing with my father way back in the day. So I'd play that just game religiously, constantly, all the time. And eventually I was just like, you know, does anybody ever speedrun this? From there, I had been approached by Jackie Joe one time on stream really randomly playing King's Quest 1 SCI and she's like, you should join the the Discord. You should, um, it's, it's a speedrun Discord and a community I put together for it. And I was like, really? Huh, I thought I was the only monkey doing this. The influx of new runners brought fresh ideas to the game. For instance, Lumophile and Bill started using a new strategy in the castle. After clicking walk on the stairs, go into inventory and grab the Nightingale. Hold enter, and Alex will place the Nightingale on the first possible frame. In addition to saving time, this prompted Jackie to re-examine the guard dogs. I was like, okay, so this is a better strat, so I should check again, and so I did another 100 tests, and I think it failed like 2% of the time was bad, right? And I was like, well, that's great. You know, this is barely a thing at all. The runners would continue to improve the route, finding new zips, and saving even more time. I will admit, I had learned the route, how it was being done before without the zips, and I was doing it and doing it, and I was like, it's just slow. I'm like, they're not taking advantage of this fast movement Alex does on this angle. I remember being on stream and just be finishing a few runs, sitting back and being like, I'm gonna try to z- route some of these in. I'm gonna really try to put this together. It really just became, like finding the right pixel, finding some line in the sand or in the floor or whatever. You know, me and Chuck, we were brothers in arms, right? Trying to find the fastest zips and find the right routing. It's just literally click this pixel. Oh, that didn't work. Click this one. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, this worked. One to the next, the next, to the next, to the next. And God, it was a pain in the butt. The crux of the runs is hitting all the zips right because they could save so much time. And then uh, Urquan just blew us out of the water when he joined. So he he got really good, really fast. I mean, the guy just has insane mouse accuracy and speed. It's, it's crazy. 
It was around this time that Jackie brought up her frustrations with the crash and offered a bounty of home-baked cookies to whomever could fix it. It appears that was all the motivation that Urquan needed because four days later, he would announce the fix, a change to a single line in the DOSBox config file along with a brand new world record. I remember just pop because it just popped up in Discord and he added everybody and was just like, crash is fixed, EMS equals false. And I just looked at it and go, oh my God, this changes everything. Urquan could have been satisfied at that point, but he wasn't the type to settle. He felt like a run wasn't really worth it unless it was a world record. And even then he didn't say that world record was necessary because that's just an arbitrary number. What's not important is beating this number, it's getting the perfect run. Urquan's 1859 was the most bonkers thing I had ever seen. Uh, honestly, it was it was just hard to believe. So I remember reviewing it and looking at it. He was just faster in everything. <laughs> and just being mesmerized by the level of skill. I'm struggling to get below 20 and he's like, yeah, sub 19, let's go, what's next? It was just too perfect, like literally too, too perfect. It was just, it was wild. It was very humbling as well, but also really exciting to, you know, have other runners for this game that I loved so much and was so desperate for other people to run it, to finally have somebody really kind of like take the reins and turn this from like my silly little point and click side hustle thing into like a very legitimate, skillful speed run. Urquan made the difference there. You made it real. <laughs> After getting his perfect run, Urquan shifted focus to a side project, a version of ScumVM tailored for speedrunners. The goal of the official ScumVM project is to create a stable gaming experience. In the case of King's Quest VI, that meant throttling the game speed, which is why we don't use it for speedrunning. But what if it were possible to take ScumVM's advantages and turn the speed throttling off. Just compare the zip speed of DOSBox and ScumVM unthrottled, and the difference is striking. Urquan would continue to develop his version, as well as running Speedy Adventures, a speedrunning marathon for point-and-click adventure games. But this would leave no time for Urquan to actually speedrun himself. By January of 2019, there were still no contenders to beat Urquan's any percent world record, though not for lack of trying. I'd run six so many times trying to beat Urquan's world record, trying to get anywhere near close to him. And I just couldn't do it. Instead of focusing on the any percent run, Chuck would re-examine the 100% category. I looked at the Hundo route and I saw Silier's run and I was like, looking at it like, oh, this is good. But you know, this guy will not stop talking about this crash. For some reason, it's a little faster to uh, save in Couture than... Uh, Silier had completed his last runs almost a full year before Urquan's crash fix. Chuck also had the benefit of Urquan's Scum VM, which, in addition to not crashing, was faster than DOSBox. Literally, I remember saying, this is the best category. This is great. I love this. You get to see the rest of the game. You get to go to the Land of the Dead, go back to the Isle of the Mist and see all these other scenes. So yeah, it felt felt great. <laughs> I felt like I could finally just enjoy the game as I remembered it. And grinding for the world record was fun. Chuck's hard work would pay off on January 16th, 2019, with a run of 36 minutes and 3 seconds. And it was about this time that I started running the game. Hey, one short eye. How you doing? Um, there's a full-on... I think I saw you doing speedruns of Sanitarium on Twitch very early on and then invited you to join one of the discord servers was very impressed and had a lot of fun watching you do runs and push the time down just shorty coming on the scene at all was just so exciting again because i'm we're always just so desperate for new people to take up this game so any new runner even if their times are awful i'm ecstatic about Let's see, I, I'm, I'm very hungry for the sub-20. We're like almost there. We're in, we're going to get there. I hope it's today. But a new runner coming in that is excellent and that you can see is just 
getting better and better and better so quickly is just so, so exciting. Yes, that's it. Sub 20. By early March, I had earned a 1929. I felt like I could no longer pay attention to chat and the game at the same time, so I started doing attempts offline. You know, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens here. We're just going to chill, sit back, uh, watch some old runs, see how that works. The whole thing was almost like a happening because he was turning it into a, a history of the world record progression to this point. This is where the records stand uh, today. The anticipation is building. I'm like, oh, what did you do? You did a thing. What kind of thing did you do? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of it, he showcased his run and he was like, I beat it. I beat the 1859. I was like, what? No way. And he did it. He showed the run. It was great. For the longest time, Urquan was just a level above everybody else. So I thought that level of, opt of execution was just insurmountable. And then other people came along and proved me wrong. Before that, it was really, okay, Urquan can do it. This superhuman, amazing runner can do it, but can anybody else? And it really kind of took, you know, this King's Quest community into that, that next step and that next era of like, okay, we're here, we have new runners, we have people that are able to improve upon things and lower the time. The way I think of it, I'm not playing Juan, I'm not playing Chuck, I'm not playing any of you guys. Uh, I am trying to beat the game. And the more people that beat this game back, the more people who drop this game lower and lower again, the more that we win. And the game cannot win because the game is hard. The game cannot defeat us. We will defeat the game because that is our proper place in the gaming hierarchy food chain. In April, Jackie was relearning the 100% route after I had found a few small optimizations. She was using Urquan's Scum VM for the first time, and there were issues. Oh, I do have a pretty fast PC. I wonder if that's what what's causing it. We didn't know why, but on faster computers, using Urquan's Scum VM would result in near constant whoa wait a minutes, making it impossible to get competitive times. So I think what was happening was it was just running too fast and he'd start wobbling. It it just sucked to feel like having this really nice computer was actually like a detriment to me, right? We discussed banning Scum VM or possibly having separate leaderboard subcategories, but didn't take any action immediately. You might be wondering what Urquan had to say. This was his baby, after all. A week before I revealed my world record, Urquan had hosted a Speedy Adventures marathon. He made a few Discord posts here and there, and then Urquan vanished. Messages went unanswered, and by the time Jackie was stumbling on the cliffs, we weren't sure if we would ever hear from him again. After much discussion, Chuck and I agreed to remove our scum VM runs from the leaderboards and ban the application for King's Quest VI. This meant Chuck's 100% world record was gone, and my second place run, completed in DOSBox, became the new world record and all of my any percent runs were invalidated, including the historic 1855. There was nothing we could really do about it because Quan had already disappeared, and he was the only one who had the source to his version of the emulator. It was a little disheartening. It was a little frustrating, but I knew that the community would persevere. You know, like console games, everyone gets, you know, a Super Nintendo or whatever. And they all have basically the same hardware that they're working on. Everyone's on, you know, an even playing field to begin with. And that's so much harder to, you know, implement, especially with like these older games. The same week that we removed the Scum VM runs, Lumafile jumped back in and got second place. He would continue that streak of success in the summer with a collection run at the North American Speedrunner Assembly. Afterwards, he would take a break from King's Quest speedrunning. I just wanted to, you know, go back to other stuff because uh, it had been only King's Quest for a long time. Um, it felt like a, a nice achievement to get it into a marathon 
and I would have loved to run it at GDQ. I actually submitted it to GDQ twice, um, but you know they didn't want me. They didn't have me, and that's you know they're lost. But whatever. I started slowly climbing my way back up, this time using DOSBox. I was getting low 19-minute runs by mid-July. I had also tightened up my 100% run, getting a 36-19. Still, my heart was set on catching back up to Urquan. By the end of July, I was extremely close to getting affiliate status on Twitch. On July 30th, I fired up King's Quest 6 any percent, thinking I would just stream for a few hours to meet the requirement for the number of days streamed. Everyone else in my house was asleep, and I was streaming without microphone or camera. Maybe it was the stillness of the night, maybe the fact that I wasn't putting any pressure on myself. But not too long into the stream, I got the run. Eighteen fifty seven. I had beaten Urquan again, but this time on the same level playing field, using the same emulator. After that, I felt like I had done all that I could with any percent. Activity in the game would mostly slow down until mid 2020. I had been living with family during a divorce for the first half of the year, but by June, I was back in my own place with a better internet connection and feeling homesick for King's Quest VI. I had also been accepted to Completeathon, a speedrun event for completionist runs, and I was scheduled to run the 100% category on June 20th. Not too long into my de-rust and practice, I was shocked to get a new 100% world record by over a minute. A week later, one day before the marathon, I was doing last-minute practice. The first few attempts were less than stellar, with two runs lost to a crash and a soft lock. What? No, no, what? Look at it, is he, he's, he's doing the animation. And then I pulled off this run. Y'all ready to see a sub 35? Completeathon went off wonderfully, with Chuck and Jackie commentating. I then returned to the any percent category, trying to get back into competitive form. At the same time, a new runner was climbing the ranks, someone who would shock all of us and change the face of the game. I saw Chuck, you know, do these King's Quest runs on speedrun.com, and I would watch some of his Twitch streams too. I watched Jackie from time to time, and she was doing kind of the same thing. And just all these people, you know, playing a game that I grew up with and loved to death. I'm just like, this is amazing. I loved watching speedruns. I loved the King's Quest series. I would go over to my sister's house. And she had it on her computer, so I would play it for a little bit. And it was her and my brother-in-law that were like, you should really, like, start grinding this and getting competitive at it. When he first started running was hilarious because I guess he had a really bad internet connection. So his runs were always really funny to watch because there was no camera or anything and the quality was just so poor. But you could tell that his skills were so good. And you're like, okay, this this is one of the ones like he's, he's going to do all this stuff. Shrek is just another insanely talented runner. It's amazing how quickly he's risen to the top. Just insanely dedicated and tenacious so yeah i remember that long that long thing um where he's just grinding and going and going and you know just being so excited that someone was gonna join us at you know this top level of running this game and we finally have another runner that's like really really doing well by july 17th shrek had an any percent time of 1901 four seconds away from my world record it looked like we were not far off from having a new king's quest 6 champion as it turns out, a monumental discovery would mean we wouldn't have to wait long at all. On the morning of July 18th, 2020, we were all watching Jackie Jo stream her any percent attempts when Chuck messaged me on Discord, asking me to check an emulation setting in DOSBox. Setting core to dynamic massively sped up the zips to nearly the same speed as Urquan's ScumVM a year earlier. 
Chuck asked Jackie to check on the stream. Would she have the same problem she did with ScumVM? I remember stomping my feet in excitement like a little kid as Jackie climbed the cliffs without issue. This was it. We were running at scum VM speeds that everyone could achieve. Shrek wasted no time leaving Jackie's chat early to start runs. He would beat the world record twice in the same stream. I would beat his time the next morning with an 1825, which Shrek would tie two hours later. I, I do remember the trading back and forth between our times, and it, and it, it felt really good because for the first time I felt like I had like a competitive rival for this. And I was like, yes, you know, let's, you know, let's, we're trading back and forth. This is awesome. This is like, this is the kind of competition I love to see. Um, and it makes each other better. It makes shaving off that second that much sweeter because you know that you're beating not just some other person, you're beating the best. He would lower his time even further to 1823 and then the next day to 1819. July 20th would also be a monumental day for Jackie Joe. With the new emulator setting discovered, she was hungry for a sub-19 time. However, each run that session seemed to end more and more tragically. Oh my god, did I get the rose? I heard the ding. I heard the ding. <sighs> I'm at the end and you know the funny thing about about the run of King's Quest 6 is once you get to a certain portion of the end game you can predict exactly what your time is. Oh my god, my heart is racing. <laughs> and I get so excited that I completely miss the final hit, the final input of the run. <gasps> Just the most heartbreaking thing that has ever to have ever happened to me while speedrunning ever. And I certainly hope it stays that way. But of course, now, you know, it's very infamous to, you know, say, oh, don't Jackie the run at the end of it, um, which I suppose will just be my legacy. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> oh, thank God. I am like a positive, optimistic person because I'm pretty sure anyone else would be like destroying everything right now. But we know we can do it. Yes! Oh! Oh, we did it! We did it! We did it! Oh my god, I'm so happy! Yes! Yes, queen! Ah! And this was better! <laughs> oh. oh my god! Oh, that run sucked. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Jackie would continue to lower her time, getting an off-stream 1834 on July 21st, just 15 seconds off world record. Shrek would take a break from any percent, moving on to the 100% category. He broke my previous world record in his first session and then broke the 33-minute barrier the next day. I hadn't forgotten about the run either. On August 1st, 2020, I had my fastest catacombs ever. I was on world record pace going into the end game. My heart was pounding as I prepared myself for the Anyway, let's keep going. Hey, thank you. This community is awesome. You've always been so supportive and funny and everything that a speedrunning community should be. I am, for this calendar year, 
in this category, I am retired. I'm not, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. This is just too stressful. I used the rest of the stream to play Conquests of the Longbow, another Sierra title. But Shrek had already left to deliver his rebuttal. But I consider the King's Quest VI any percent run to be like my pride and joy. Out of, out of all the runs that I've done, that's the one I'm most proud of. That's the one I worked the hardest on. You know, that's the one I grinded the most. That's the one I really set my sights on. You bet your ass I, I'm getting back on there. Oh, come on. Are you kidding, Leo? Shrek had tied my time. Again. He would keep going and earn a blistering 1812. So, when the dust settled, Chuck, Jackie, Shrek, and I had all managed to beat Urquan's unbeatable time. On August 2nd, Topkeck Shrek would remark that getting a sub-18 minute time would require a near-perfect run, and that he was likely done running the category. Unless a new skip was found. The cat it seemed long. I was watching her stream. She performed the alt skip, and I did not notice. It did not cross my mind that something looked weird. I was completely oblivious to that happening. For some reason, I didn't catch that she had skipped the entire puzzle. How was this amazing glitch discovered? A few months earlier, Sluicebox had accidentally joined our Discord. On August 8th, 2020, Sluicebox revealed that the tile maze can be completely skipped by pressing the alt key. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Why does that exist? <laughs> like, that's such a... Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, walking is very different in that room, right? Um, for that puzzle to work. So yeah, anytime you walk, it's got to snap you to a grid and that's very different than any other room. And so what it's trying to do is it's trying to not get confused by weird things like control click. Holding down a modifier key and clicking results in special behavior. For instance, pressing control and clicking toggles between walk and the last cursor. If you're using a one button mouse, shift clicking cycles the cursors. So in the tile room, the game first checks to see if you're holding down a modifier key. If you are, then the game runs whatever special code it's supposed to. And that would totally be okay if there weren't this third modifier that they forgot about, and that's Alt. With Alt, it passes that first test. And because it's not used for anything, there is no code out there that's like, oh, I see that you pressed Alt, I will run special stuff. There's nothing like that. So just the normal stuff happens. And the normal stuff is that you would walk somewhere. It was very exciting that something like that was found as well, because it's like, there are real glitches in this game that could be game breaking. Like we're talking about skipping a puzzle here. If you can skip this puzzle, what else can you skip? If we don't care about points, there's another bug that saves even more time. Alt clicking on the edge of the screen bypasses the code that normally tells the game which room to put you in next. Alt-click the direction you entered from, and you'll warp to the opposite room without walking across the screen at all. I was like, oh my god, you know, combine that with the time I already have, you know, we're looking at some serious business, buddy. Two days after Sluicebox revealed the alt-skip, Shrek would drop his record to 18.05. But despite this success, the 18-minute barrier still called out to him. I'm so tired right now. I just six hours of meetings today. I'm literally exhausted, but I really wanted to do runs tonight. The goal is to hit the promised land, the sub 18 threshold. We'll see if we can seek out the land that Berta has promised us. So I guess we're just going to see what happens. So without further three hours resetting on the beach, screwing up very easy puzzles misclicking, feeling extremely frustrated with myself because I knew I could do better. I knew that 18 was possible. I just needed to like get that wrong. And... Cause 
Seema. Are you all right? Hooray. Hooray. I'm Hooray. fine, Alexander. I was just so afraid for you. It was just so exciting to see him progress so fast and, you know, just to to finally blow another barrier out of the way. You guys are rock stars. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting me. Really appreciate it, guys. I really, really do. Kasima and Alexander. Who was watching me that night? It was my siblings and my brother-in-law who first got me to do speedruns in the first place. It was the people that I watched who inspired me to do runs like Jackie and Chuck and One Short Eye. It was more special than any world record I've ever gotten. I just need to hear you say If you would help me go or stay No tower, baby. Girl in the tower, I'm reaching out. Please tell me what to do. In October of 2020, Jackie received some exhilarating news. Acceptance into GDQ's Fleet Fatales event. The million years ago when I was running Majora's Mask, I actually made a group uh, that was called the Zelda Lady Speedrunners because there weren't very many of us. There were like five. I knew like three or four other women that did speedrunning at all. <laughs> and now, you know, there's an entire group and an entire marathon of women speedrunners. And finally, this year, I really had the opportunity to do it. I had the time. Um, I had been running the game for a while and was, you know, very good at the run at the time. So I was like, oh, this is my opportunity. Let's go ahead and submit it. Who knows if they'll pick me, right? In response to Jackie's acceptance to the big stage, Sluicebox dug into one of the items on his to investigate list and revealed something amazing. The Isle of Wonder is guarded by five gnomes, one for each of the five senses. To get past them, you'll need to gather five different items to fool them. For instance, Grump Frump here has a heightened sense of taste, so Alex holds out a mint. In SCI games, each screen is a room, and each room can only have one room script at a time. On every game cycle, the beach checks to see if you're in the gnome trigger area. And if you are, and there's not already a room script, then the gnomes start and the gnomes become the room script. So what would be great is if we could summon our own room script while we travel across the trigger area, because that would prevent the gnomes from showing up. Uh, the problem is there's not many room scripts that we can just arbitrarily summon. And the ones that there are, they're all hands-off scripts. That's when the cursor becomes a crown, you don't have any control, and if you were in the middle of walking, then that just stops immediately. But there's a bug in the hands-off code. When you click somewhere to walk, first you turn, and then you walk. Hands-off will stop you if you're walking, but in SCI, turning isn't walking. They forgot about turning. And so you can start a room script while you're in the middle of turning, then that turn will still complete, and then you will start walking even though you're in hands-off mode. You just heard a sampling of the love ballad, Girl in the Tower, written for King's Quest VI. If you'd like to hear the entire song, please contact your local radio station and request it. Refer to the station directory included in your game box for call letters and phone numbers of participating stations. Thank you for playing King's Quest VI. I've been wanting a gnome skip forever. If you've run this game for any length of time, you know what it's like to fumble with the interactions getting an item up to the gnome. You want that to be over with forever and ever and ever. Skip them damn gnomes. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. You don't have to gather any of the items and you don't have to go through all the animation. That's crazy. And there's more. The game has an internal act structure, like a play with five acts. 
One of the act transitions is fooling the gnomes. But because we skip that, the game's act variable never reaches the fifth act. When we arrive at the castle, the game thinks it's earlier than it actually is and doesn't play a long animation with some serving girls. And here's the most bizarre part. The genie loves mints and somehow gets drunk on them. It's just got a magic map. In the short path, Alex needs to give a mint to the genie to defeat him at the end of the game. Since we normally give the mint candy to one of the gnomes, we have to go into this cave and grab some mint leaf, which is really annoying because zips don't work here. But with gnome skip, we never lose the candy. And even though you're never supposed to have it at the end of the game, you can still use it on the genie anyway. Oh my god, this is... This is crazy. I know the feelings of other people in the speedrun community that it's like, if there isn't a big sequence break, if there isn't some big glitch, it like doesn't count. Seeing something like that get found for my baby for this game was just like, oh my God, now we matter. Two days after Gnome Skip was revealed, Korzik discovered that you could do the same skip with the boring book. Mm. Phew. What an incredibly boring book. This method was almost three seconds faster than using Girl in the Tower. Jackie would be the first to capitalize on the new strategy, dropping the world record below 16 minutes. Let's go! Top Keck Shrek was close behind, getting a 1534 just a few hours later, and then 1522 the next day. On November 14th, Sluicebox found a way to use the map to skip the gnomes, which is significantly faster than using the boring book. Shrek would use this knowledge to get a 1519, and Jackie would be right on his heels with a 1529. This would be her last run before showcasing the game to the speedrunning world. So we're going to do three, two, one, go. Okay, so... At the top, we're just grabbing stuff on the beach. We're gonna take this time to talk about zips. So you may notice- It was just that the funnest experience. It was so, so exciting uh, for, for the community, for the run, um, and for me. And guys, you can see she's been zooming through this part <laughs> and she's been going at those kind of corner angles and that's what those zips are, making sure that she can get through here as fast as we possible. We did it, we made it through. I didn't miss too many zips, I don't think. Just a, just a little handful. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing, I think. Um, I remember like 2018 when the community was slowly growing um, and everyone was like, yeah, we should like try to get this um, into some sort of GDQ and then point and click adventures are like super hard to like get into a GDQ. Pretty happy that King's Force was there. And I mean, compared with like the history of uh, video games, like I think King's Quest at least kind of deserves to be like in the list. Two, one, now. There you go. And that's King's Quest 6. <laughs> Great <Prost -top>. job. <laughs> Woo, I did it. I can't believe it. <laughs> you did it. That was fantastic. <laughs> All right. I'm awesome. So, not... yeah. So, we've got this little cutscene that I can let run. I'll do a quick little. In the week after Fleet Fatales, the runners would continue to pick away at their times, with Jackie getting a 1523 and Shrek dropping the world record to 1513. But if you thought that was impressive, just wait until you see what came next. On November 23rd, Sluicebox posted this image to Discord with the promise of a new route to be revealed that night. In the catacombs, alt click to skip past the tiles, grab the shield, which you need to get past a stone archer later in the game, and then walk back to the entrance room. This is the same bug as Gnome Skip we're weaponizing it in some new and exciting ways. They're checking on every frame to see if you have walked into those trigger areas on the left or on the right. And as soon as you touch one of those, then that runs the walk out of the maze room script, which is the, the correct way to leave the room. And that does all of the necessary bookkeeping to update everything. And the other part of the story is like, you know, what can we do with that? And it's like, oh my gosh, we can do all kinds of things with that, um, that quickly get into how the, how the maze is structured um, internally. We're walking over the trigger area and then we're hitting the room, the actual edge of the screen. 
Then the standard Sierra room script uh, that controls every normal room in this whole game, suddenly that gets used. And that's not what's supposed to happen at all. You know, so it doesn't know about all this maze stuff. So it does a room transition, but it does it in a normal way. And it doesn't take into, we, yeah, it doesn't take into account all the maze stuff that was supposed to happen so that you don't break the maze. And, and that's how we break the maze. Since we bypass the trigger, the maze doesn't update the direction you're traveling in. Instead, it looks at your previous direction when you went down and does that again. Except the room down is actually the topmost room on the lower level of the catacombs. You can then travel to this screen. Book skip again, hitting the north screen trigger, and you'll end up in a sort of phantom room that isn't normally accessible during gameplay. Do that one more time, and you've phased directly into the Minotaur's lair. Sluicebox called this the Cataclypse, a combination of catacombs, apocalypse, and clipping through walls. How'd I feel after Sluicebox dropped his big old bombs on us? Amazing. It doesn't look like it could have problems, but by golly, give it to someone who's crazier about the games than all of us combined. And yeah, you find some pretty insane stuff. Since we can book skip to the second level of the catacombs, we don't have to wait out the long animation of falling between levels or light the tinderbox. We don't need to do the ceiling crushing room, and we don't need to get the brick because its only purpose is to stop the gears. We don't need to use the hole in the wall, so we don't need to play the flute for the wallflowers. We don't need the flute, so we only have to visit the pawn shop once in the very beginning to get the mint, magic map, and the nightingale. When Cataclypse was discovered, it was awesome. Because it was like, we are shaving off not just seconds, we're shaving off minutes of this run. And it made me wonder, how low can this time get? You know, like, wh where is the, where's the floor? By the time he logged off in the early morning hours of November 24th, he had shaved an entire minute off the run. Four days later, he would see a session with 1401 and then a 1358. And finally, on November 29th, an offline run clocking in at 1355. Between Jackie's GDQ run and the new Catacombs glitches, there was a renewed interest in King's Quest VI speedrunning. All of a sudden, there are eight people actively running King's Quest VI. And I was like, yes, this is what this community deserves. You know, all these active runners. But there was something about Shrek's world record that still left him feeling dissatisfied. It was cool to get 1355. It wasn't that feeling that I got when I first got sub-18. It wasn't the feeling I had when I first got sub-14. It was just me tired before I went to bed doing a couple of runs, no one was watching. It's so much better with an audience. It's so much better with people who want to see that run happen. That's why people watch speed runs, right? They want to see something special happen. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. This is it. Having a heart attack over here. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. Records are made to be broken. And I, I see so many speedrunners say those famous last words. Good luck beating this one. And it's just because someone's gonna beat it, man. It's going to happen. I'm looking forward to that. People adore these games. They have it somewhere in their heart and in their heads, and it's either something from their childhood or just something they played, and it struck a chord with a lot of people. And I'm amazed by that, because I thought, I thought maybe it was just me. King's Quest community, honestly, it's gotta be the best speedrun community out there, where everyone is always helping each other. No one's an ill-spirited competitor. It's, it's amazing. And that's what I loved about this community. That's what I loved about running this game. I have here written 
King's Quest 6 any percent. Goal equals sub 28. I'm excited to see if it gets any lower. There's just so much potential still. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's just so, so exciting to see the community just go from, you know, me being alone in my room to now, you know, I think we've got like 80 or 90 people in the Discord, something like that. It's, it's exciting every single day. Um, and I just love it. <laughs>